Okay, so let's talk about these key biomarkers for aging, like from a metabolic perspective. What do you think would be, you know, the most indicative of Mm -hmm. biological aging and what biomarkers are good to look at? Yeah. Yeah. My first one would be fasting insulin. If I could... If I could change um, healthcare policy and practice in the United States, my one thing would be to have insulin be a standard measurement on every blood test. As much as the average individual is going to go in and get their annual checkup, they're going to get their glucose, they're going to get their A1C, they're going to get all their lipids and uric acid. Those can be great, and there's ones there's some worth vis- revisiting in a moment. But to me, the fact that we don't include insulin on that panel is a, an absolute travesty. It is, in my mind, the best overlooked marker. So fasting insulin, if a person can get their fasting insulin measured, do it. If that measurement is six microunits per mil or less, it's a great sign. If it's up to about the mid-teens or high teens, that's maybe an okay sign because insulin can be dynamic. But then if it's in the high teens to the 20s, it's a problem. That's a warning that you're metabolically off. Um, And then let's come back to some of the common ones. The triglyceride to HDL ratio is a great surrogate marker for not only metabolic and like insulin resistance, but also cardiometabolic, where we focus so much on LDL, for example, but the triglyceride to HDL ratio is a way better predictor for cardiovascular risk than LDL is. So triglyceride to HDL ratio, if it is, if so, you take your triglycerides, which you're always going to get on a blood test, and divide it by your HDL cholesterol, which you're always going to get on a blood test. If that number is less than 1.5, that's a great sign that you're doing well metabolically. And then, I maybe uric acid is is another one. Although I could go on, but uric, I did mention uric acid. It's another one of those that really well done longevity study, the Amortis study from Sweden. It looked. It found that uric acid was one of the very few predictors that, when they looked retrospectively at these people measuring the same markers for decades, their glucose control was a predictive variable, and their uric acid was a predictive variable as to who lived the longest, healthiest lives. So, lower uric acid is going to be better. And just for general metabolic health, would you add in some of the HbA1c and, you know, maybe ApoB. So L- you mentioned LDL. I mean, they don't even directly measure LDL. They don't. ApoB would be obviously a more direct measure, but then looking also at particle size, which I get, I again think is important. It's the small I do too. LDL particles. Yeah. yeah. So which- I do too. Yeah. So LDL, as you mentioned, and I actually described this in my book, why we get sick. I talk about the, the, like, why is it that we have such conflicting data across LDL? Some studies say it predicts, some studies say it doesn't at all. Maybe it's because we're not accounting for the diameter differences. Even then, most people won't have had their diameter measured. The triglyceride to HDL ratio is an awesome surrogate. There's a beautiful figure of a study. I can't remember the citation, but I can recall the figure perfectly. It actually looks at the difference in population of the big LDL, the buoyant, versus the, the small dense LDL. And wouldn't you know it, right around that triglyceride to HDL ratio on the x-axis of 1.5 is that crossover. So as the triglyceride to HDL ratio was higher, it reflected a higher particle B uh, or type pattern B rather, LDL. The lower the triglyceride to HDL ratio was, the more it reflected a pattern A, the large buoyant, apparently less atherogenic. So once again, we could come back to that pretty reliable surrogate. 